Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and this time we're going to take a look at uh, how we might connect our modern and probably expensive test equipment to some older valve technology. We're going to look at some of the risks involved in doing that, how we can mitigate those risks and hopefully along the way um, using my rather ancient Kodar valve HF receiver to see if we can to make some improvements to its performance. Uh, I should point out right now that obviously when you're working inside something like this there's mains voltage but there's also considerably a lot of more high voltages involved with valve equipment um, and you obviously need to be very very careful how you do that I can't recommend you do it and if you do decide to do this kind of thing you're obviously doing it at your own risk Right, that said, let's start by having a look at the circuit diagram for this radio and see it is, uh, see what we can try and achieve. Here then is the circuit diagram for the Kodar CR70 and it's a 5 valve receiver with the valve rectifier and three of the five valves are actually dual valves. Um, we've got a a triode heptode and we've also got two double triodes uh, however the double triodes don't really concern us uh, today. The IF uh, part of the transceiver then is um, broadly speaking is inside that uh, that box I've highlighted there uh, V1 transformers T1, T2 and V2 and finally the um, diode actually converts the IF into audio frequency. So let's have a look how the signals flow through the circuit. Um, so the um, signals from the antenna are fed into the grid of V1. Now V1 is interesting, it's a, it's a hybrid valve, we'll talk about a little bit more about that in, in, a, in a while. Um, but the other half of it which is a triode actually forms the oscillator um, part of the, of the receiver and that valve allows the oscillated signal to be mixed with the incoming signal. Uh, the results of that mixing are fed into transformer T1. Uh, that then ends up at the grid of V2 for some more amplification. Finally through uh, transformer 2 and then eventually fed to D1 which is a germanium diode that acts as a, a envelope detector can, to convert it to, uh, to audio frequencies. So what we want to do really is we want to isolate that little bit of the circuit that's just the IF. Now it would be more than possible to feed the signal into the grid on V1. However, what I'm going to do today to illustrate um, some of the issues you can have with valve gear is I'm actually going to feed it into the, um, the output of V1 at the anode. And um, purists among you will argue, well, you don't need to do that. You could do the, the grid. Yes, you're right, I could. Um, by doing it at the anode, I'm um, post any mixing that goes on in the uh, in V1. So uh, whether that helps or not, I don't know. But to illustrate what I'm trying to illustrate today, it's useful. And then finally, I want to take the out out signal from uh, the transformer two side of D1. So let's first have a look how we're going to make those connections. OK, so here's the underside of the receiver. This is uh, valve 1. Pin 6 there is the anode of the left-hand side of that valve. So I've got the scope ground attached to the chassis there. And I'm just going to, uh, as carefully as I can, put the probe on pin 6 without touching anything else. And we've got a waveform there, as you can see. And I'm going to just pause the scope. So we've got a, a waveform. Let's just stem. Um, Pop some cursors on that. There's a bottom cursor. And uh, oops, try and get this right. Okay, so you can see there in the panel it's saying the delta between the cursors is um, about 110 millivolts. So 110 millivolts is pretty low, shouldn't have any problem attaching things to that, should I? Well, let's not just rush into that. If you are familiar with valve technology, you know exactly what is coming. Let's um, let's just have a look um, what the multimeter makes of that uh, that of that same uh, that same pin six. So I've got the multimeter on DC volts, 
and I'm just going to probe the same point there and as you can see I think fairly clearly the meter is now saying 255 volts DC so that 110 millivolts AC signal which is at about um, according to the scope is at about one and a half megahertz is actually superimposed on over 250 volts DC and there's a couple of things to think about here and that is of course the principle that it's possible for both um, alternating current and direct current to coexist in the same circuit and that is exactly what's happening so uh, connecting up um, the scope to that was no issue because the input for the scope is uh, 450 volts um, so wouldn't uh, be too concerned about about that um, which is well inside the scope and I've also got the, the probe on, on times 10 there um, so no issue for the scope but if I was good that's that's where I want to feed the signal in and the spectrum analyzer can only deal with the very most 50 volts so if I were to now take the output from the tracking generator and attach it there and uh, then switch the set on I'd pretty much destroy the um, uh, input of the spectrum analyzer and I'm sure that would probably be uh, painful not only for me but also for my wallet um, so we don't want to do that so we need to try and do something about it so let's just um, hop back to the circuit diagram for a moment and just have a quick look what's going on and why Okay, having seen that we've clearly got uh, quite a high voltage uh, to deal with, let's have a look at um, what's actually going on there and why that voltage exists. So V1 is actually an ECH81 or sometimes a, an equivalent will be a 6AJ8. It's a triode heptode frequency changer and that valve in particular is is particularly a, a radio specific valve and it's designed to act as the first um, bit of uh, amplification for the received signal but the other half of the valve the triode is designed to form the oscillator and uh, you can see they share a common cathode at the bottom let's just have a look more closely at the valve so they have a common cathode at the bottom and there's a connection from the cathode which runs across the um, the top of uh, the left hand side of the valve before before the anode and that's essentially where the the mixing goes on so uh, let's look at why we've got or uh, this 250 odd volts going on so the way a valve works is uh, on the on the cathode there are an abundance of electrons and they're being excited by the heater which is the curved element underneath and the electrons don't really like each other's company they tend to um, uh, like poles repel sort of, sort of thing so they're very keen to get away from that um, cathode and without a bit of direction they're quite happy to just spill off anywhere really that that's happy to have them so the way the valve works is that we um, encourage the electrons to move towards the anodes and we do that by applying a positive charge to the anodes which will attract the electrons and there's two anodes in that valve so the electrons will be pulled towards the two valves and that uh, high positive voltage is what we saw there as the D DC voltage it's sometimes called the B plus and in that valve the B plus on the uh, heptode side is actually uh, over 200 volts whereas on the triode side it's actually less and there is a 56 k ohm resistor um, which drops the voltage down a little bit for the for the anode of the of the triode side but that doesn't really concern us here today so uh, what we're trying to do then is feed a signal in here and remove the signal there and the reason we want to remove the signal there is because on that side of the diode we've still got the um, modulated signal with its 470 kilohertz uh, uh, center frequency the other side of that diode which is acting as an envelope detector we should only really have um, the audio frequency which corresponds to the envelope of the of the IF uh, frequency so what we need to be able to do is to feed our signal in in a way that um, allows us to do that without um, encountering issues with the 
high DC voltage. So we need some way of isolating the DC voltage from the um, tracking generator input as that will only stand 50 volts and we've got 250. So what we need to do is we need something which will uh, block direct current but will still allow alternating current to pass and I'm sure most of you are now screaming at the screen saying it's a capacitor and of course exactly that's what it is. A capacitor will do the job nicely. It is important however that we pick a capacitor with a sufficiently high working voltage um, that we don't risk any kind of breakdown going on. Now if you've not got a capacitor of the um, high working voltage it's possible to put capacitors in series and although that reduces their capacitance by adding the reciprocals uh, that actually uh, increases um, the, the working voltage available because the working voltage is divided across uh, one or more capacitors. Um, that's beyond the scope of this video but um, there are uh, ways and means so to speak and that's quite a common way to get over the uh, working voltage limitations of a, of a capacitor. So let's have a look um, how the practicalities of that work. Okay so I've got uh, things set up to see if we can improve the alignment of the receiver. Before we just get going I mentioned the use of a capacitor to block the DC voltage. This is the arrangement in practice. It's a 100 nanofarad capacitor 630 volts working so it's well above the voltage we measured and I've got a little bit of heat shrink on that capacitor lead there to the little clip lead so that it's not possible to touch the the side where the high voltage will be. I've done a similar thing the other side not strictly necessary and I've got a little just uh, solder blob there to make it easy to connect things to. Uh, so that's that's the arrangement I'm going to use at the um, detector end. I've already got the lead connected to the anode of V1 so let's just convince ourselves of what's going on here. So I'm just going to pop the meter onto the anode and you can see there we're getting about 200 and nearly 257 volts on the anode. Now the other end of that capacitor there which is attached to the anode is attached to this uh, clip lead here which goes to this BNC that's going to be the tracking generator input tracking generator input. So I'm just going to measure the voltage on the center pin which is where that red um, clip is connected to and once it's settled down as you can see it's less than 0.1 volt it's arguably it's arguably zero uh, so in other words we're quite safe from that 257 odd volts at the other side um, so I'm going to connect the um, second lead to the uh, IF side of the diode so we're on the side where we can read the RF signals and I'm going to connect um, the spectrum analyzer input to the other end of that capacitor I'm just going to use a scope lead so I'm going to do that now and then get set up so you can see the display properly okay that's the spectrum analyzer display there you can see I'm using the the web uh, screen grab because it's easier to show you that than try and record the screen so I'm going to connect up the tracking generator and then next I'm going to attach the spectrum analyzer input to the to the diode okay and quite a dramatic change there uh, in um, in shape of the trace so that trace starts at 450 kilohertz on the left goes across to 490 and the center is 470 and 470 kilohertz is the uh, stated IF of this radio so first thing to note is we're not quite on it we're slightly off probably doesn't matter too much but that is quite an easy adjustment so I'm just going to see if I can tweak it exactly onto 470 uh, yeah there we go very slight adjustment I'm fraction of a turn is now altering that and I think if I take the control out, yeah, I think that's good enough. That's on 470. Now these two IF cans here, they're the, they're the things I'm going to adjust. And I don't actually have um, the ability to adjust the top slugs because they unfortunately have been glued in with something and I don't want to damage them. However, there are two other slugs at the bottom of the transformer that run along the same um, thread and I can adjust those. So my aim here is to try and improve the um, centre gain if we can and see if we can even out that um, 
that obvious imbalance. Now I'm going to start with the transformer that's at the front end of the radio for no other reason than um, it just seems like something to do. So I've found the slug there and I'm going to turn anti-clockwise and seems to be changing something. Yeah, it is actually evening out that imbalance, isn't it? Okay, I'm still turning... Ah, noticeable improvement there. That left-hand side is now a lot nearer the right-hand side. Yeah, that's almost looking equal. I keep it, I'm still turning anti-clockwise. Yeah, I think I've gone past whatever was a good point there, so I'm going to go back to it. Okay, that's obviously evened up the trace. Let's go on to the second transformer bottom slug and see if we can do anything there. I'm turning anti-clockwise because it seems that it wants to go that way. Ah, there we go, that's a little better still. So, yeah, that's the noise has dropped down a bit more. Let's just pop back to the first one and see if... Um, we make any difference here. They obviously, uh, in these situations, they do work together. So um, I'm turning anti clockwise, uh, not really making very much. I think I've probably improved it as much as I dare there. One thing to notice is I haven't actually got the center peak any higher. So when this was first set up, um, they clearly did a good job of that. So whether that's original. I don't know, I suspect it might be, so well done Kodar for that factory setting. Okay, that's probably about the best I'm going to do. So let's now um, pop a marker on and uh, we'll make it a, a normal marker at the top there. And then I'm going to pick a, a second marker and I'm going to make that delta relative to marker 1. And let's now move the marker away until we get to about minus 3 dB, which is half the power level. Just coming down there, there's... That's about minus 3 dB there, and I'm about 1.5 kilohertz away from the first marker. So that would be roughly the width of a, of a 3 kilohertz, roughly the width of a single sideband signal. So one of the criticisms of this radio is it's not terribly selective, and I, I'd agree with that. Um, if you've not got adjacent channel interference, it's actually pretty good at receiving sideband. Um, if you've got, for instance, on the 40 meter band, signal's quite close, and it, it's not terribly good. Um, and if we now continue until we're about 3 kilohertz away, um, so I'm moving the marker down to about, that's about 3 kilohertz, so the total width there would be 6 kilohertz, so you could just squeeze two single sideband signals in there. We're about 12 dB down from the center point, so no, not terribly selective, um, but uh, hopefully we've improved it a little bit with the, with the changes that we've made. Okay, and just for completeness sake, if I now wind that second marker down to sort of well down the skirt here, you can now see I'm about um, nearly 5 kilohertz away, so it'll be about 10 kilohertz wide down there, which is more than, uh, it isn't really selective enough um, for SSB, so one can understand why the radio is criticised for that. However, for the kind of stuff I listen to, it, it's, it's bearable, um, and it's a bit of um, nostalgia. Finally, the one thing I want to show you is uh, what happens um, when you make use of the IF gain control, which is here. So currently I've got it back to right off to, to zero. If I advance that, about halfway. As you can see it doesn't really do anything to the IF centre, it just brings the um, sides up and if I fully advance it, as you can see that probably all it's done is, is made the adjacent, adjacent um, channel interference even worse. So back off to about halfway, still the same, back to a quarter, um, a little bit of an improvement and that's back to zero. And my experience of using the radio on receive is the first quarter of a turn does um, sometimes helping um, getting you to get a little better bit sound of signal but it doesn't um, uh, do a great deal beyond that first uh, quarter of a turn and we can see graphically here the impact of fully advancing that IFK in control and then back to zero. Okay well 
uh, we've seen some visible improvement there on the on the graph on the spectrum analyzer hopefully that's going to translate into something which um, uh, sounds better as well the the proof will be in the 18 when I've uh, put it all back together I'll see I might be getting it to bits again and having another go but hopefully what you've seen there is there's uh, some of the potential dangers um, that are inside a radio not just from a personal safety point of view they are clearly there be careful remember it's at your own risk but also when you've got for instance an expensive bit of kit like a spectrum analyzer that's got 50 volt maximum uh, on the ports uh, you clearly don't want to um, exceed that that could prove rather expensive so hope that's made some sense if you've liked the video please click the thumbs up if not you can click the thumbs down either way thanks very much for watching and we look forward to seeing you on the next one